Hey, welcome back to Pop Culture Graveyard. I am Hollis. If you have not done yet, please think about subscribing. This way you can be alerted whenever I cover a really cool band, like today. Today I'm going to be talking about Generation X. They weren't your typical punk band. They were young, pretty, and angry, but they sounded like ear candy. Today I'm going to profile Generation X and how they were way more than just a launching pad for Billy Idol's solo career. So let's get into it. You know, we sometimes take the term pop punk for granted these days. That there was always a genre for bands like Green Day or Blink-182 or whatever the fuck is being put out now. Pop punk has even become somewhat of a dirty hyphenate for fans of real punk. But pop punk is not a bad thing. And in my opinion, it starts with Generation X. Known today mostly as the little punk band that Billy Idol left behind when he went solo to conquer the world, Generation X, or Gen X, was a great band in its own right. And all of the things that you love about Billy's voice and performance style was already present in Generation X. Generation X consisted of Billy Idol on vocals, Tony James on bass, Bob Derwood Andrews on guitar, and Mark Laff on drums. Billy and Tony were the band's songwriters. But what you might not know is that Billy Idol wrote most of the music and Tony James wrote most of the lyrics. In the studio, however, everyone contributed to the sound of the band and Bob Andrews was a kick-ass guitarist. Mark Laff might not have been studio quality, but he was an explosive drummer inspired by Keith Moon. So this band had a very distinctive sound. Rather than sounding ragged or strident like many other UK punk bands at the time, Generation X's sound was lightning fast and powerful, yet very easy on the ears. Their melodicism, along with their good looks, prompted some at the time to question their punk rock credentials. Well, Billy was part of the Sex Pistols entourage known as the Bromley Contingent, and Tony James played in the Clash precursor, the London SS, with Mick Jones. So that's about as punk rock as you can get. Further alienating their punk brethren, Generation X wasn't shy about telling everyone how much they loved The Who. When I listen to Generation X, I actually hear the rhythmic flair of the early Who. It's just updated. It wasn't long before the band made a name for themselves and were signed by Chrysalis Records. In March of 1978, Generation X released... Generation X. The running order is slightly different on UK and US albums, so I'm just going to talk about the US album today because this will be what most viewers are able to track down in the record shops. It also has, in my opinion, better sequencing and more bang for the buck value-wise with 12 tracks to the UK album's 11 tracks. Incidentally, it was produced by Martin Rushent, the man behind the best albums by the Buzzcocks and the Stranglers, so it sounds amazing. The US album kicks off with Give Me Some Truth for a punk band releasing their debut album. Having your first track on it be a skank rock John Lennon cover is kind of an odd choice. If nothing else, it proves, at least to Generation X, that John Lennon was a total badass, whose angry songs still fit their take-no-shit ethos. I think the American record company simply wanted a recognizable song on here as a sort of skeleton key, which unlocks the sound of the band for people coming late to the punk rock party. It's a clean guitar sound with crisp drumming and echo-drenched vocals that imbue Lennon's original with a propulsive energy. The next track, Wild Youth, is a celebration of the freedom of the punk movement. It's their The Kids Are All Right, if you'll forgive a Who reference. From the latest footwear on your feet to the hair that makes people stop and stare, Wild Youth is perhaps Generation X at their most inane. But that's sometimes where this group excels. From the Heart is Next, it's the track that originally kicked off the UK album, and it's Billy Idol's idea of a punk rock love song, set to a stutter step guitar attack. The lyrics are a righteous promise from Generation X to tell the truth with their music. The lyrics state, and I quote, Like Lennon said for me, I believed in Ray and Keith. Like Townsend said for me, rock and roll made me free. Second John Lennon reference. And paying tribute to Ray Davies of the Kinks and Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones. Pretty rare for UK punks to give credit let alone respect to the older guard. The up-tempo Ready Steady Go is next, and it's one of Generation X's best all-time songs. 
It's the first song I ever heard by them as a small lad listening to WLIR in New York. The song's title is a tribute to an old music show that ran from 1963 to 1966, and it was hosted by the adorable Kathy McGowan mentioned in the song. It's hard not to be taken aback by Bob Andrews' fantastic guitar playing here, as his licks on the chorus cut through the entire song almost like sirens. I defy you not to get amped up when you listen to Ready Steady Go. The song Kleenex is quite simply a love song to masturbation. Why don't we leave it there? Promises Promises is a very fun history lesson, with Generation X at their most glammy, taking a trip through the early days of punk, when bands would make their own shirts with sprays and knives, and save up for weeks to buy gear at Malcolm McLaren's store. The point of the song seems to be to slap the sonic wrists of all of their punk brethren who sold out breaking the promises they all made to never sell out like the older rock stars. The ones who, as the lyrics state, didn't die young, they got big wastes. It's a rocking track, and Bob plays some masterful lead guitars over this melodic masterpiece. Promises Promises showcases the outstanding perfection and production on Generation X albums. Their records just simply sounded better than a lot of other records at the time. Side 2 kicks off with Day by Day, which seems to be about the rat race, working day after day, not keeping up with inflation, let alone with your neighbors. This is as close as Generation X gets to social commentary on this album, and it's encased in a wonderfully animated rave up. 100 Punks is one of the best songs on this album, and it was my favorite Gen X song for years. It celebrates the brotherhood of punk. At the same time, it underlines the scene's cookie-cutter identity, where an entire revolution quickly became defined just by a look. It's kind of a sister song to Promises Promises, and it's a street cred check to fellow punk scenesters. The next track, Your Generation, can perhaps be seen as Generation X's theme song. If the Who's My Generation defined a moment for mod culture, Your Generation summed up punk's moment in the sun with clear accuracy. It even playfully calls out the Who with the line, there ain't no time for substitutes. I believe the song is about punks being fed up with hearing how great the previous generation's music was. And the words, your generation doesn't mean a thing to me, sums up that anger perfectly. Kiss Me Deadly is next. Talk about burying the lead on an album. Kiss Me Deadly is perhaps, perhaps, Generation X's best song. It appears to be, among other things, an ode to street violence, which was rampant at the time, in Southwest Six and elsewhere, not just a problem in Fulham, when punks had to fight their way through the streets to get anywhere, danger never sounded so appealing. It's also about teenage sex, the essence of which is captured in the magical couplet, in ecstasy but they can't make a sound, case her mother might come down. How fucking great are those lyrics? We've all been on that couch at that time of night. Some of you might have first heard Kiss Me Deadly in the movie SLC Punk, but I bet not all of you know that it was inspired by Bruce Springsteen's Jungle Land. Let that sink in. That track's storytelling aspect inspired Billy and Tony to write a narrative about their own life experiences. Mission accomplished. Wild Dub is an echo chamber version of their earlier song, Wild Youth. Give Me Some Truth is not on the UK album. It's a bonus track tacked on for American release. Instead of Wild Dub, the UK version has a track called Too Personal. The band here actually drops into a fun, bassy groove, unlike other UK punk bands' attempts at Jamaican version. Here, Gen X embraces dub with pure hearts, while staying true to their own sound, and the results are funky as fuck. This album finishes on Youth, 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 the Ascensa theme. The band triples down on their primary ethos, music for young punks, by young punks, as heard on earlier tracks, Wild Youth and Your Generation, this track allows Bob Andrews to shine, where he presents us with like a two-minute guitar solo that's both dissonant and melodic at the same time, revealing way more chops than your run-of-the-mill punk axe man. This album is about as cohesive a statement as any London punk band made, and it's as impressive a debut as you're going to find in any genre. In January of 1979, Generation X released... Valley of the Dolls. This album was produced by Ian Hunter, lead singer for Mott the Hoople. Tony James was big into Mott the Hoople at the time, much like his old compatriot Mick Jones used to be, and they thought it would be a good idea to have him produce this album. The results are interesting. Some see it as uneven. I happen to think this is a great album, but this is in many ways a much more mature sound for the band, and I am a sucker 
For any time a band's reach exceeds its grasp, I'll take a swing and a miss on some of the things they try on this album, over playing it safe and giving us the debut album a second time. Opening track, Running With The Boss Sound, for my money, features Billy's best vocal performance on this album. His voice really had a timber back then that was second to none among male punk vocalists. This is the one track on the album where Bob Andrews shares a writing credit with Billy and Tony, and given this track's unbridled guitar attack, it's easy to hear why. This song lyrically sets the tone for the entire album to follow. It's a love letter to all the rock and roll myths that seem so attractive in our youth. The fact that those myths ring hollow later in life is luckily absent from this album, giving it a romanticism that has aged well. Lyrically speaking, from rockabilly to ska to heavy metal, this track does not discriminate when it comes to the definition of boss sound. Second track, Night of the Cadillacs, is my favorite song on this album. I used to love putting on this track when I'd be out DJing. The lyrics cast drag racing cars as sci-fi starfighters, where crazies and devils are driven by a rock and roll sound. It's Gen X at their most heavy, and it really showcases the rhythm section of Tony James and Mark Lapp, who deposit the mayhem into a laid-back pocket respite before once again launching into the hectic maelstrom. Incidentally, I mentioned earlier that Mark Laff was not what you'd call a technically proficient drummer. So Ian Hunter brought in Clive Bunker, who played along with Mark on every single drumming track. The dual drum sound is one more exquisite touch that adds to the unique sound of this album. Believe it or not, Clive Bunker was the original drummer in Jethro Tull. Yeah, I know, I know. The funny thing is, Clive wasn't any technical genius either, so he played with a raw energy, and the sound of he and Mark together meshed surprisingly well. Paradise West is a ballad with a beautiful vocal from Billy, which is let down somewhat by uninspired music. It reads almost as if the band were pressured into doing another Kiss Me Deadly, but with Paradise West 1 standing in for the hellish Southwest 6, it feels like a trip into a diseased mind where the Travis Bickle-like subject of the song struggles with some bad ideas. The best part of the song is the outro, which almost hits the ear as Gen X's In the City, if you'll excuse a Joe Walsh reference. Friday's Angels is one of the sweetest, most straight-up love songs Generation X ever did, with delicious backing vocals and a real driving beat. King Rocker is a superhero battle between Elvis and John and Paul from the Beatles, fighting for the titular King Rocker title proving once again that Generation X had way more respect for their elders than most punk bands. Believe it or not, King Rocker was the first single off the album, not the title track. That was released as their second single. Valley of the Dolls is by any measure one of Generation X's best songs. It's a celebration of the band itself, with Gen X being the gang of four or the gallant four in the lyrics, who are kicking ass on stage and keeping young girls fainting and rockettes up rocking. It's got really cool lyrics. My favorite lyrics are song number one and the rhythm up amping. Drummer beats down 4-4 four, four rock ranking. A bass so deep thud thud spine shaking. And all around mad eyes are rolling. Come on. If you've got to toot your own horn, that's the fucking way to do it. The whole track is pumped along by Bob's pop punk guitar bounce. And it's the most memorable song on this album. The next track, English Dream, is my deep cut off this album and is one of the hidden gems by Generation X. I believe this track pointed the way that Generation X should have continued music-wise, with an almost Joan Jett sound. It's a sweet mid-tempo rocker reassuring kids that they can make their English dream come true, much like Billy, Tony, and the boys did, and it's even got some of my favorite backing vocals on the entire LP. Love Like Fire again puts Bob's guitar front and center, but don't sleep on Tony James's bass guitar, because he's doing amazing things if you listen closely. Tony's melodic bass playing was the secret ingredient to the sound of Generation X, much like Glenn Matlock's was for the Sex Pistols. Love Like Fire is a much more evolved sound for the band, and it's as close as this album gets to an almost Hanoi Rocks-like ragged rock sound. The epic track, or combined tracks, The Prime of Kenny Silvers, parts one and two, ends this album with a master stroke. First of all, the song has better production than any other song on this album, and it's a well-produced album. And this track, more than any other track on the album, sounds very Mott the Hoople. And that's not a bad thing. It's got Ian Hunter's fingerprints all over it. The song is dripping with melancholia, which when blended with the band's usual ear candy sensibilities, produces a magical masterpiece. 
there's a depth to this track. And it's that emotional core which makes this song feel like Generation X's love reign over me. Trust me, the Who references make sense. Valley of the Dolls is where this era of Generation X ends. Before I get to Generation X's last official release, I want to talk a little bit about the Sweet Revenge sessions. In 1979, the band went back in the studio to work on their newest album. The sessions did not go well with the band fighting a lot. Most of the acrimony was centered around Bob Andrews and Mark Laff, believing that they should share in the songwriting with Tony and Billy. Tony and Billy, who did most of the heavy lifting when it came to songwriting, felt differently. Bob Andrews and Mark Laff angrily left the band, but not before recording some great tracks. Bob Andrews released tapes of these sessions on his own in 1998 against Billy and Tony's wishes as KMD's Sweet Revenge the KMD standing for Kiss Me Deadly. A lot of the songs on these sessions would later wind up on Kiss Me Deadly, the final release from the newly dubbed Gen X. But before we get there, Modern Boys is a fun track that didn't make the cut on Kiss Me Deadly. Stars Look Down sounds fantastic here, and I believe I even prefer this version to the one that's later on Kiss Me Deadly. The track Girls, Girls, Girls was credited just as Girls on the Kiss Me Deadly album. Anna Smiles is an underrated track with Bob Andrews kicking much guitar ass. I think the main reason Bob ended up releasing these tapes, in addition to being able to screw over Billy and Tony, is because he was proud of all the stellar guitar work he laid down. Flash as Hell almost seems like it stole its title from an Adam Ant solo album. Flash as Hell is nothing to be scared of. Psycho Beat almost sounds like Billy Idol fronting Gun Club. That should sound good. And Kathy Comes Home is one that I really like, that I think should have found its way onto an album. Is it our second Kathy McGowan reference? No, it's not. I believe it's actually referencing the 1966 film of the same name that tackled mental health and homelessness. Fairly heavy subject matter for Gen X, but they use a rather subdued sound on this, and it's pitch perfect. Anyway, Billy and Tony took some of those songs, headed into the studio with producer Keith Forsey, and in January of 1981, the newly dubbed Gen X release, Kiss Me Deadly. As proof of how good Bob Andrews was on guitar, he was replaced by a few guitarists on this album, but mostly by John McGeoch, who gives a real cohesiveness to this album. Steve Jones, late of the Sex Pistols, was brought in to provide typical Jonesy guitar raunch, or bollocks as Tony and Billy call it, on a couple of the tracks. And they brought in Steve New, who was a gifted but troubled guitarist, who previously played in The Rich Kids and had become an axe man for hire. Steve New was the one who played the fantastic guitar lick and solo on the album's iconic Dancing With Myself. The final stroke of guitar weirdness is that of all the guitarists I've mentioned, it's James Stevenson, who was shown on the album cover and credited on the album's notes as guitarist, who doesn't actually play on the album. And former drummer Mark Laff was replaced by original Clash drummer Terry Chimes. Keith Forsey, the producer of this album, brought a glistening production sound with him that would help propel all of Billy Idol's 80s albums towards the top of the charts. This album kicks off with Dancing With Myself. This is the original version of the later hit for the solo era Billy Idol. The amazing thing about this recording is just how similar it is to the later version that would take over the world. Other than a difference in production and the way Billy's vocals are mixed, the dynamics and sound of the song don't differ all that much. If anything, this version has less bottom, and in my opinion, is a little too trebly to get people to move their feet, but it's still a great version. It was released as a single in October of 1980, and surprisingly, it did not chart. The next track, Untouchables, sounds very much like the blueprint for Billy Idol's entire solo career. Happy People is a rather simple affair, based around a basic drum beat and an occasional guitar but it makes up in spacey atmosphere what it lacks in musical complexity. It even finds the boys dabbling in dub for the first time since their debut album. Heavens Inside is the first track on this album, where you'll be like, oh right, John McGeoch plays on this album. You can hear his unique style clearly. The lyrics of this song are really representative of how this entire album rebukes the previous album's rock star mythology. Triumph is one of the heaviest songs on this album. It's written solely by Billy with some of his most straight-ahead lyrics. And I hate to say, for me, it's kind of a throwaway song. Revenge kicks off side two, and is, in my humble estimation, their 400th song with the word knife in the lyrics. The track Stars Look Down has some of the best production on this entire album. 
Unfortunately, the song itself isn't that inspired. If anything, it proves that, in the absence of a tight band or well-crafted songs, Billy's voice is the real star of this album. We'd be happy to hear Billy sing the phone book, and on Stars Look Down, he kind of does. The song What Do You Want kicks off with an opening riff stolen from the old surf guitar song, Pipeline. Unfortunately, the lyrics are pretty pedestrian, with Billy just shouting the title of the song over and over. The track Poison is next. Poison is my deep cut on this album. Poison combines some great John McGeoch guitar, an urgent bass line, and a fantastic drum sound into a musical bed that at times sounds like a cross between Public Image Limited and Devo. And that ain't a bad thing. A song with the title Oh Mother is rather a strange way to end this album, but it seems kind of perfect for an album this odd. Generation X was a fun live band, so I want to talk a little bit about the 2002 release of their Radio 1 sessions, which are actually three different John Peel sessions that were recorded between 1977 and 1979. The best of these sessions, quality-wise, is the final one, which makes sense. The band is seasoned by now, and it's not thrown by the live-in-the-studio setting. Check out Love Like Fire, English Dream, and Night of the Cadillacs to hear what I'm talking about. They sounded amazing here, and it's a real shame that this classic lineup was about to implode. Much maligned drummer Mark Laff is spot on here, for my money, and Bob Andrews' fiery guitar work drives the whole damn session so do not sleep on the Radio 1 sessions. After the demise of Generation X, Tony James went on to found Zig Zig Sputnik, which would have been the best band on the entire planet if their musicianship and songcraft were anywhere close to the level of their hair and costumes. More satisfyingly, Tony later teamed up with The Clash's Mick Jones, his old pal from the London SS, and the two still release music as Carbon Silicon. Bob Andrews and Mark Laff went on to form the post-punk band Empire, who put out this fantastic album, Expensive Sound. This album failed commercially, but was a big inspiration to a lot of emo and hardcore bands, and it is a highly, highly recommended album from me. I will put a link in the description below to my favorite track off Expensive Sound. Billy Idol would release a number of albums in the 80s that would take over the world. But that's a story for another episode. And that is it for this week on Pop Culture Graveyard. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. If you did, please hit the subscribe button and ring that little bell. And I will see you next week with a lot more cool stuff. Take me back home, yeah!